So now the seventh season of the Great British Sewing Bee has come to a close and we're all looking forward to the final. Now for me, there have been many highlights this season, but one in particular was in the Transformation Challenge when they introduced this parachute cloth called Ripstop Nylon. I remember using this as a kid. We used to make these kites and go outdoors and fly them and they were elaborate and very colorful. And so I've decided to use this ripstop nylon fabric in what will be my final tutorial this season. And I'm making a garment inspired by streetwear, using the elements of sportswear, punk, skateboarding, and Japanese street fashion. Let's have a look at what I made. So here's my streetwear inspired piece using four different colors of ripstop nylon. This is a parka, it's hip length, with an elastic drawstring waist. It has a kimono inspired sleeve. I'm using a double zip and a placket that poppers over the zip line. It has a stand collar in contrast, contrast band lining, placket lining, and I've used these colors to feature the pockets as well. Wherever I've used a popper, I've color coordinated it. So on the facing side here, we have a white, green for the contrast, and gray on the outside. Now, I've tried to incorporate as many of the techniques that we used in our tutorials into this piece. So we have our stitch in the ditch here, and that white stripe. We've Explore gathers using this elastic line. And this is adjustable with this elastic cord. And I'm using a stopper as part of the fastening. We've faced the kimono sleeve with a contrast. And again, we've used the understitch. Repeating that technique here in the collar and in the band. And using the technique when we face our necklines with that folded over bias tape, I've used that technique in creating this vent, which is under the arm of the sleeve and the body as well. Another feature is the option to adjust the length of this parka and to get the zip and the placket out of the way. If you want that sort of a look, And again, there we are. So it just changes the look by changing the length. And we're using the same system of fasteners to accomplish this. So there we have it. Four different colors of ripstop nylon in our streetwear inspired parka. So now you've seen the garment. Let's have a look at some of the construction techniques used in the making of it. Here I'm working with a piece of ripstop nylon fabric. You can see in this weave it has a warp and weft pattern in it which makes it easy to work with patterns. On the straight of the grain here we can see that it's very taut, no stretch. On the cross grain, 90 degree angle, there's a bit of bounce. But it's here on the bias, the true bias, the 45 degree angle, you can see there's quite a lot of stretch and ability here to shape and use like a dressmaking cloth. So this is sturdy, it's strong, stain resistant, static resistant, but one of the disadvantages of nylon is that it will melt and burn. So I'm going to just apply here a dry iron, it's not very hot, and then I'm going to add a little bit of steam. You can see it's starting to change its composition. And now a little bit more steam, and here we go, you see. So you have to be very careful. Eventually it will retain its shape, but it's best to use hand pressing. Even the, the warmth of the table here is starting to have it curl. So here's our nylon. We're going to see what we can do with it. Here's a gathered section. And because nylon, ripstop nylon, doesn't fray, it's very easy to cut into a ruffle and have a clean finish. As we've learned in um, a previous tutorial, 
we've set this up with two parallel lines of stitching. Use your largest stitch on your machine, the basting stitch. So two lines together and that gets put into a straight section. So here this top part is already seamed off and you can see that we have sewn our seam line just below that bottom level of our two parallel lines of stitching. And when it's all set up, you can see that ripstop nylon does give you a very clean finish and an easy way to finish off your ruffles. Another way to use gathers is to set up an elastic casing. And here we have a contrast casing and we're going to use an elastic cord. Tied to the end of a safety pin, we're just gonna um, ease this through, feed this through our contrast casing very easy to set this up using that warp and weft grid of the nylon. It makes everything straight and aligned. And now on the end, the drawstring end, we're going to add a stopper. These are spring-loaded and you can see when you just depress the string that you get that hole that you feed your elastic cord through. So we've done that and by depressing and, and releasing the spring you can see how you get that stopper effect. So you can set it up and then decide on the length. Now see how this you use this to achieve your gather line through the casing. To finish off the end, you can use one of these end caps and you just feed it through the smaller end and then tie a simple knot, you do one or two just to make it secure. And then that end cap will just fall down and finish off the look of your elastic cord. We're going to face a neckline using a bias section that we've cut. We cut a small inch section. We don't have to sew a stay stitch around the neckline because this nylon doesn't stretch. Now to prepare this um, facing, I folded it in half while I was doing other things. I just set it with a clapper and a few weights and that set in the fold line. So now folding this with the raw edges together and placing the two raw edges to the raw edge of your neckline, we're going to set up and stitch this facing. And we're going to try to add a little bit of ease into this. We're going to ease the facing onto the neckline. And I'll show you how that works. I've pinned the bias section to the neckline edge. With a bit of ease, you can see the rippling here in between the pins. Now I'm not going to sew this as pinned. I'm just using this as a guide. So every time I release a pin I will let the easing of this bias band, I'll let it go a little bit so that I don't create any um, pleats in my work. So here I've just started to sew, release the pins and just use this, use your eye use your fingers to just work out how much fullness is working and just let it go if it's too much because there's a lot to do here with this slippery fabric you've got to keep your eye on the presser foot edge make sure you're maintaining that quarter of an inch seam allowance you've got to watch your pins you have to watch the left side which is your garment so that there's no pleating working its way in there and you've got to make sure that you can see that little ripple effect as the cloth leaves the machine, as it leaves the stitch behind the presser foot. You can see the little curling edge there. So I am getting a little bit of ease in. And I can see now that I've, I have created a little bit of pleating. We're not going to worry about that. There's, there's one, there's maybe two, but you know what I'm talking about here. This is about practice and learning how to assemble these layers of fabric in what is a very tricky fiber. So now we've come to the end. We'll take the work out of, our, out of the machine. And now it's time to understitch. You can see one or two please. We're not gonna worry about it for now because this is just, just to demonstrate how you manipulate these. Now we're clipping the curves. We're clipping into the stitch line. Your concentration should be a bit closer together where the curve is steeper. Where we're on the straight here are the cross chest. You can clip a little bit at, at longer intervals. But now as we come back into the shoulder area, 
we're going to make our clips. Whoops, there we go. It's very flighty fabric, you can see. Make our clips a bit closer together. Now, take all layers of the facing and secure them together in an understitch. Now, this is easily seen here because I'm using contrast. So our garment is a dark gray, the facing is a light gray, and my thread is white. So we can keep our eye on things easier because we've got different colors. So we're stitching as close to that ditch, as it were, the seam line, but we're stitching on the light gray facing and keep our work as neat as possible, stitching it as close to that ditch of the seam as possible. And now with our ender stitch complete, you can see, even on this tricky fabric, you just turn it in along that seam line and look even, even along this curve. See how obedient that is? Because we've prepared, we've eased our facing on, we've understitched, and even in this tricky flighty fabric, everything is in place. And you can add a top stitch, which you probably would need to do to keep everything secure. But there's our facing. We're going to introduce using wax with our hand sewing because it can really help control the thread. And here I have a sample of the contrast green collar as it's set in to the garment. I have two different types of wax, and here I have a single thread with a knot tied in the end, and we're now going to draw it through this first cake of wax, which is set in a plastic cap. Using your thumb as leverage, just pull the thread through, make sure it gets into the wax, repeat this process. Here's another type of wax you might use, and we're now going to press it in to our thread. So we're going to move aside our sample so the heat doesn't bother that. And now using our iron, we're just going to pull the thread through onto that piece of fabric. Add a little bit of steam. And now you can see how straightened out the thread is and it's got a really nice body to it. And you can see how it's going to be much more easy to manipulate through our, our layers of cloth. Now I'm just going to show you a few stitches, but we're going to use this stitching line, the thread from the stitching line where the collar has been attached to the garment. We're going to pick up just that thread, none of the fabric, and then pull it through, having made a stitch through the collar. So once again, just pick up the thread from our seam and then stitch it on to our collar fabric. You can see how easily that the thread is moving through. We'll try another stitch, just picking up the thread of that seam and attaching it to the fabric of our collar. And one more stitch. So this isn't really to show you how to hand sew because you know how to slip stitch, but this is just a demonstration so you can see how much easier a task it is when you use thread preparation using this wax. There's uh, several products on the market. Uh, choose the one that works right for you. Let me see, I'm just gonna tie another knot. Even when things get in a muddle, you can see the thread still behaves. It's right through that loop, and there you are. So it's a much easier task to sew. Have yourself a cake of wax on hand all the time. Let's look at how we are going to construct this complex decorative band on the front of our jacket. We have the top section where we've seamed in our white strip between the two layers of gray using our grid. This was really easy to cut things and seam them together. We're going to back it with a piece of white so that we bring out that white stripe and then we're going to stitch these two together in the ditch. This all gets faced with a contrast green facing. And to fix our closure, we're gonna use our plastic snaps and we're gonna match them to the colors of the band and the contrast facing. So here we are at the machine with our three layers. Our top layer, which is the decorative junction, our backing, white, and our facing in contrast green. 
So we're going to lay these two fabric pieces together and we're going to stitch in the ditch. So I'm using white thread because I'm stitching very close to the gray, but I'm going to lay the stitches onto the white. So if you're using contrast colors and you're stitching in the ditch, use the color of thread that is most applicable to the side that you're working on. In this case, my stitches are going to fall on the side of the white. So now we've got a couple of over stitches and we're going to now come down the other side. Stretch the two fabrics apart so that you can expose that ditch. It's much easier to see when you have this contrast fabric. So now we've come to the end. And now we're going to apply the facing. And once again, now you have three shifting layers of a very slippery fabric. So you have to take a bit of care here. Now I've not used any pins, but I would advise it. It just keeps the fabric in line. When we're finished applying the facing, we're going to put a row of understitching in now. Make sure all layers of fabric lie on the facing. Stretch again, pull the two pieces of fabric apart, just so you're going to get an even stitch line. And you can see the ditch that's exposed and you can make sure that your understitch is straight and clean. Now you can see how easily this is going to all roll back and give you a nice finish. We're going to sew the bottom edge now, so we have to reverse our layers of fabric, fold everything back, including the understitched fabric. And now I'm going to use a slightly bigger seam. I'm going to use a half inch, five eighths, whatever, because this gives you a little bit more body at the bottom of your facing, the bottom of your band. And now to prepare to turn the corner, I'm going to show you a little trick to get that point crisp. We're going to fold the seam allowance. We're going to fold that back in and hold it with the thumb and forefinger of one hand and then reach through and take that lump of fabric and then just pull it through. So now you can see we're nearly there with a very crisp corner and our crisp understitched edge. And all we need to do is just with a point of a pin, pull out that final stitch of that point and there you can see a really beautiful 90 degree angle. So now let's just set in a popper. Let's refresh that. So we'll mark our position of that end cap and now we're going to use a set of contrasting snaps, gray and the green, our crimping tool, our pliers, that we introduced a couple of tutorials ago, and of course, our trusty awl. Now we've got quite a few layers of fabric. We have three, and possibly I might have marked this inside the hem facing, so I might be looking to put a hole through as many as five, six layers of fabric. But take your time with this and just use a twisting motion. Use your left hand, or the, under, the hand that's on the underside, um, to feel when the awl pops through. Because once it does, you want to then work out a larger hole to make sure that that end cap will go through. So I think we've got a big enough hole you can see there. And now I just simply place the point of that end cap through. And now working on the underside, this is really important that you push down all layers of fabric so that the entire point to that end cap is in view because you need that whole thing, that whole point, to attach itself to the other end of that popper. So we've done that, and now we place the other end over. Now remember that that white attachment is where the end cap sits into. So place that in, so that's securely in to that end cap mold, and then line everything up, pull your fabric away from that end cap, and then give it a good, a good close of the pliers. 
so that everything is intact and fixed. And there you have it. Just a sample of how you would construct a band, face it, and finish it with a popper fastener. So now you've watched the demonstrations and you've seen these techniques and how they can be applied in all sorts of diverse ways in a garment. And what I'm hoping is now you'll be able to spot these different techniques when you look at clothing and when you look at your own wardrobe and what other people are wearing. You'll be able to recognize how they're constructed. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial, and I hope you don't think this is going to be the end, because this has been a lot of fun for me to put these things together, and I'm going to be thinking ahead to what other kinds of tutorials I can put forth. So stay tuned to my YouTube channel, and good luck to all the finalists.